Uh, we've tried to uh, raise the visibility of extended deterrence in uh, the work we do here at the center and more generally at the national level because if, if you uh, take the view of the argument we've been bringing through this series of workshops, extended deterrence has gone from being the secondary consideration to central strategic deterrence with major powers to the central question. Uh, you know, the argument we've been bringing is that we face three adversaries, Russia, North Korea, and potentially China, that have developed strategies for conflict with the United States that try to separate our allies from us and from each other. Uh, and so when Kim Jong-un notes that if he ever has to employ a nuclear weapon, uh, the very first weapon he employs will be dropped on Tokyo, this is all about trying to persuade the Japanese Prime Minister that there is no point in allowing the dispatch of those forces that sit on uh, in Japanese territory but are committed to the defense of the Republic of uh, Korea. And uh, so our, our allies are in the nuclear crosshairs of these countries. Uh, and this re should be reinvigorating our national discussion of the role of our nuclear commitment to these allies and more generally the question of how we adapt and strengthen extended deterrence to the new security environment. Uh, so we've tried to bring a number of uh, speakers in and to create a number of workshops that address this set of questions. Uh, and we'll be doing more in the future um, because this topic's not going away. It's only growing, growing more intense uh, unless we find the miracle cure to um, the problems that ail us in Northeast Asia and Central Europe. Uh, accordingly, we've tried to bolster our capacity as, an, as a research center to do some leading thinking in this area. And toward that end, uh, we were very pleased to be able to bring in uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, our speaker today, Yasek Durkaluk. Uh, some of you will remember a presentation he gave here uh, a couple of years ago when he was a visiting scholar at the Naval Postgraduate School. At the time, he was a pre-doctoral fellow, uh, working on a dissertation exactly along the, align the lines of, of this topic today. Um, our allies in Europe pay a little bit of attention to the experience of our allies in East Asia with the U.S. nuclear commitment. Our allies in East Asia pay a lot of attention to the experience of our allies in Europe with the U.S. nuclear commitment. And the American expert community generally has no idea that this watching and discussion is going on uh, and that this comparative uh, aspect uh, is prominent in the thinking of our allies and generally not so much in our own thinking. Uh, and Yasek was one of a, a very small number of people who have done any thinking at all, and his is more than just thinking. It's a fully systematic and uh, very successful doctoral dissertation. Uh, Yasek, um, prior to joining us, and uh, was a member of the uh, Polish Institute for International Affairs, a member of the research staff there. Uh, PISM, as it's known, uh, is a government-funded think tank in Warsaw that's done leading thinking, uh, not just in Poland, but in, uh, in, in Europe and in, indeed globally on uh, these important new questions on the emerging security environment. Uh, he also did a tour of duty in the Ministry of Defense of Poland, uh, serving as a subject matter expert in the Missile Defense Policy Office in, in that ministry. Uh, so we're very grateful to have been able to welcome Jacek to the center. We're very grateful to welcome you here today. Uh, Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you Brad, very much for your uh, introduction. And uh, thank all of you that, uh, for, for coming here and for your interest uh, in, the, in, the, in the topic. So, as Brad said, I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow at Center for Global Security Research. And I may, my main focus is uh, uh, US external deterrence in uh, Europe and uh, the Asia Pacific. And today I will try to explain uh, uh, how U.S. extended uh, deterrence creates uh, links between uh, U.S. allies in uh, Europe and uh, in the Asia Pacific. And as Brad said, uh, uh, this presentation includes some uh, main findings of my doctoral dissertation, which I defended at the Jagiellonian University uh, in Kraków, Poland uh, last year. Um, but uh, 
my doctoral dissertation was focused on Obama administration and uh, I will talk a bit uh, about Trump uh, administration and, and, uh, and beyond. Um, so uh, my presentation uh, will be divided in four parts. Uh, first, I will briefly introduce my main research question and basic definitions. Uh, second, I will present arguments uh, supporting the thesis that during the Obama administration, uh, Europeans and uh, US allies in the Asia Pacific, so Australia, South Korea and Japan, were aligned uh, by default. Third, um, I will discuss uh, how relationship between European and uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, allies of the United States uh, could evolve uh, during the, 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 the Trump uh, administration. And uh, I will conclude with some food for thought on uh, uh, whether alignment by default could transform it into a different type of, of uh, relationship. And, uh, what might be possible costs and, and, uh, and, uh, and benefits. So let me begin with uh, main questions which guided my research. So my main research question was whether and how US extended deterrence in Europe and in the Asia Pacific has created security interdependencies uh, between the US allies in these regions and what might be the possible consequences. And why this particular question? Um, I have been working for, uh, I, I have been working uh, on US extended deterrence for about uh, a decade. So I have seen that there is a, a fair amount of research about US extended deterrence in each region. So there is a, a bit of a smaller number of comparative uh, analysis. Uh, what is striking is how little research has been conducted on how US security guarantees in, in both regions are uh, interlinked. So uh, my aim was somehow to contribute to, 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 to fill this, this, uh, this existing, existing uh, gap. One source of inspiration of my research was a uh, will analogy coined by Arnold Wolfers in the uh, late uh, 1950s. So Wolfers compared the system, system of US alliances uh, to a wheel. In this wheel, the US allies are spread out along its, li along its uh, uh, rim, each occupying the end of the spoke. And uh, United States is located at the, at the hub. And According to Wolfer's observation, danger to a US ally in one region is expected to prompt a, a strong response from the United States, the hub. However, in the same time, the, the same reaction is not expected from the US al allies uh, located at the end of opposite spokes. Uh, just, just, uh, just the opposite. So, US engagement in another region only leads to their worries. First, about a weakening of the US commitment to their security, and second, about being dragged into an unwanted confrontation in a remote area um, elsewhere. In I in my research, I examined to what extent Wolfer's analogy applies to extended deterrence today. To what extent are expectations about the US allies from different regions similar? So what if anything has changed? How has US extended deterrence in Europe affected US security guarantees uh, um, to uh, to the Asia Pacific allies, so Australia, Japan, and uh, South Korea. And to answer these questions, I developed a theoretical framework to analyze links between uh, US extended deterrence in, in different, uh, different regions. I referred primarily to scholarship on deterrence, but also on uh, alliance politics. 
So I was particularly inspired by Glenn Snyder's uh, Alliance Politics and Robert, Jer Robert Jervis's uh, System Effects. U.S. extended deterrence in my research is defined broadly as, as the U.S. commitment to be ready and able to use all non-military and military tools, including nuclear weapons, to prevent aggression and coercion against U.S. allies, and to assure allies uh, that their vital security interests will not be in any way uh, jeopardized. Uh, I have concentrated only on two regions, so Europe, and the Asia-Pacific putting uh, Middle East uh, aside. And as you know, in Europe, extended deterrence covers all NATO members. And in the Asia-Pacific, it covers uh, Japan, South Korea, and Australia, even though US uh, didn't, hasn't explicitly stated that uh, US security guarantees to Australia include a, a nuclear uh, component. And What's important is that in both uh, regions, the demand for U.S. extended uh, deterrence has uh, grown in the past uh, decade, and uh, it is because of the deteriorating uh, security uh, landscape, mainly because of, of uh, assertive and aggressive uh, actions of uh, Russia, North Korea, and, and uh, China. Building on the concept of interdependence uh, articulated by uh, Robert Keohan and Joseph Nye, I define interdependencies between U.S. Uh, regional extended deterrence commitments as relationships, relationships in which uh, the functioning of U.S. extended deterrence in one region affects its functioning in the other region, and this relationship of mutual sensitivity could lead to mutual vulnerability. So it happens if changes in the functioning of U.S. extended deterrence uh, imposed lasting effects on uh, U.S. allies in the, other, the, in the other region. And this definition of interdependence um, doesn't prejudge the consequences of particular interdependen interdependencies. So, they could be so interdependencies could be associated with costs or benefits. Uh, they could be symmetrical or asymmetrical. So costs and benefits do not have to be evenly distributed among uh, U.S. allies. Uh, the interdependencies could be mutually positive. Uh, in that, changes in one region affects the allies in the other region in the same way, in the same way. so win-win or lose-lose uh, situation. But in some circumstances, interdependencies could have negative effects. So changes that would be beneficial to the allies in one region uh, could, be, um, could have negative uh, effects to, to, to allies uh, in, the, in the other uh, region. And, uh, of course, uh, interdependencies could be objective or subjective. So they could only reflect uh, the perceptions of U.S. Uh, allies and uh, uh, perceptions, even if uh, inaccurate, uh, they are political realities. And what does it mean to say that U.S. allies from Europe and the Asia-Pacific are aligned by default. Uh, first of all, it's important to note the difference between the alignment and the alliance. So alignment, using Grant Snyder's terminology, uh, is defined as expectations of states that they will be supported by other states in their interactions. Uh, in contrast, an alliance is a formal associated, uh, association of, of states to, to use military force in specific uh, circumstances. And the alignment by default means that even though U.S., European, and the Asia-Pacific allies are for the most part not formally aligned by treaty commitments, because of the shared reliance on U.S. extended deterrence uh, 
their security is uh, interdependent. And changes in U.S. extended deterrence in one region affects U.S. allies in the other region in at least three different ways. So the first is what I call security perceptions uh, interdependences. And they can take two distinct and somehow uh, contradictory forms. So on the one hand, an, a change of U.S. security pri priorities and greater fo focus of the United States in one region uh, could lead to anxieties of, of the allies in, in the other region about being abandoned or entrapped in, in unwanted uh, confrontation. On the other hand, uh, U.S. actions or inactions in one region uh, can affect U.S. credibility in the, in the other region. The second is security interest uh, interdependencies. This means that sharing the key ally, the, the United States, uh, contributes to a convergence of the security interest of U.S. allies in different regions. So an alliance an alliance with the United States influences policy choices of U.S. allies while responding to security challenges in the, in the other uh, region. And the third is military interdependences. So even though U.S. allies in both regions do not depend on each other's like, military support, like their military forces, because of sharing the, the, the same ally, the United States, are somehow interlinked. And so U.S. allies in one region are uh, sensitive or vulnerable to changes in another region for reasons related to uh, U.S. force posture, operational requirements, and declaratory policy on using specific military uh, instruments. Let's now turn to the, to the second part of my uh, presentation. So my doctoral research showed that during the Obama presidency, US, European, and Asia Pacific allies were aligned by default. So all three types of interdependencies took place, even though the extent to which each type was corroborated was uh, different. So it was especially difficult to determine whether security interest interdependencies took place. Also, interdependencies looked different in NATO Australia, NATO South Korea, and NATO uh, Japan uh, relations. And in fact, uh, my research demonstrated many methodological and uh, practical challenges in examining different types of uh, interdependencies. Also, I think it's important to underline that uh, the, the list of, of uh, interdependencies which I uh, present is not finished, so we can env envisage and imagine many, many, many um, different uh, uh, inter interlinks between uh, two, two regions. And to test whether security perceptions inter interdependencies existed during the Obama presidency, I examined two questions. First, did the rebalance of U.S. security policy to the Asia-Pacific lead to European anxieties about abandonment or entrapment? And second, did the U.S. refocus to European security caused by Russia's aggressive actions against Ukraine and Crimea annexation <coughs> influence the security perceptions of uh, U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific? And uh, for both questions, the answer was yes. So the research showed that the U.S. strategy of pivoting to the Asia-Pacific strengthened the anxieties of some European NATO uh, members about uh, a lessening of U.S. commitment to European security. And this anxiety has been expressed by uh, especially by Central and Eastern uh, European NATO members, but also by some Southern uh, European uh, NATO members. And uh, 
Similarly, the deteriorating security situation in Europe uh, has strengthened anxieties in the Asia-Pacific about uh, U.S. resolve uh, to implement the, 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 the pivot to the Asia-Pacific. So uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, was perceived by some experts in the Asia-Pacific as undermining one of the assumptions of the U.S. Uh, pivot that Europe is a, a security provider, not a, not a, uh, not a consumer of, of uh, security. And there were concerns about further diverting uh, attentions uh, of the United States to Europe and away, of, and away from, from uh, Asia. Um, ex excuse me to interrupt, but when you say this, can you tell me uh, on what evidence? Is it a set of statements made? Official statements made, unofficial statements, just so I can understand. Yes, so that's where I'm heading. So, okay, <laughs> so for example, in case of Europe, the depth of anxieties was uh, um, is, is demonstrated by a lot of different, like U.S. attempts to assure the uh, European allies, which. Uh, uh, which, uh, which, which somehow showed the, 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 the uh, European concerns. So, uh, like, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation, you can see the statements uh, of US, two, two U.S. Secretaries of Defense and the uh, U.S. Um, Vice President, which reflect the, 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 the um, anxieties of, of uh, Europeans. Of course, there are also, like, many different statements of U.S. experts, but also officials uh, on, the, on the record. So I cannot just uh, uh, present all of this, of this uh, evidence, evidence, uh, evidence uh, here. And uh, uh, the same as in the case of, of uh, Europe, uh, the U.S. administrations, uh, the U.S. administration tried to assuage the concerns of uh, U.S. allies in the Asia Pacific. So, uh, for example, there, on, the, on the bottom there is a fact sheet of Euro European reassurance initiative. So, the U.S. efforts to put like more funding for U.S. military presence, and it's interesting and, and striking that it underlines that it doesn't uh, somehow negatively impact any other U.S. U.S. Uh, commitments, mainly the, the rebalance to, to, to the Asia-Pacific. And this sort of anxieties also like, are reflected by uh, uh, discourse of security experts. And, and uh, uh, I think that makes the case that this, this, this interdependences uh, uh, took place. And... Um, And uh, what's, uh, what's, 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 what's important and what uh, deserves uh, somehow uh, highlight, highlighting, it's important to, 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 to know that European and Asia-Pacific allies didn't publicly express fears about getting entangled into, into the crisis in the uh, other region. So even though still the, the um, deterioration of U.S.-Russia relations created some uh, difficulties for Japan. So it complicated Prime Minister Abe efforts to sign a peace treaty with Russia and, uh, and uh, resolve the dispute over the Kurile Islands. Uh, also, US-China tensions raised some questions about the uh, European approach to, 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 to uh, China. But I will talk, talk, talk about this uh, a bit, a bit uh, later. Um, uh, it also deserve, uh, deserves uh, highlighting what uh, Brad said in the, in the introduction, that U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific had been more attentive and more prone to draw conclusions about U.S. credibility on the basis of U.S. actions in Europe than vice versa. And uh, I have several hypotheses uh, that may explain this, by, but I think they, they require... Uh, further research, so we can uh, go back to this in the Q&A uh, session. What's 
I think um, interesting and important to note that uh, uh, somehow contradictory to, 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 to what I, I said before, the attention given by US Asia Pacific allies to the security situation in Europe uh, somehow contributes to credibility of uh, US extended deterrence in, in uh, Europe. So this is uh, illustrated uh, by an observation of a, of a former Latvian uh, officials who linked credibility of uh, US security guarantees to the Baltic states with US security uh, interest in the, in the Asia Pacific. So uh, he used the, 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 the classic domino effect uh, argument. And uh, moving to the second type of interdependencies, the security interest uh, uh, interdependencies, to examine them, my research tackled two questions. First, did the alliance with the United States influence the European approach to China's assertive actions in the East and South China Sea? And second, did the alliance with the United States influence Australian, Japanese and South Korean responses to Russia's aggressive actions uh, against uh, Ukraine. And I think that the response to both questions was yes. Still, the existence of security interest uh, interdependencies was uh, difficult to, to prove. So one of the reasons is that uh, even though there was a convergence, uh, there was no full harmonization of the policies of, uh, of uh, the U.S. allies, uh, in, 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 uh, of U.S. and its uh, regional allies. For example, the U.S. expected the Europeans to take a stronger stance on uh, Chinese uh, uh, build-up of artificial islands and, and their uh, militarization. And while Australia and Japan follow sanctions against Russia after the, the annexation of uh, Crimea, uh, their scope, especially of, of the Japanese uh, sanctions, was smaller than, uh, than the scope of the sanctions of the United States and the, and the uh, European uh, Union. And the alliance, and what's, what I found interesting, is that the alliance with the United States had only a lim limited impact on uh, South Korea policy. So, even though South Korea condemned, condemned Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine, uh, Seoul refrained from imposing uh, even a symbolic sanctions against, against uh, Russia. And what makes the establishment uh, or, or approving of the security interest interdependencies more difficult is that uh, both European and Asia Pacific allies uh, policies uh, were influenced by several different factors, not only the, the alliance with the United States. And it's really difficult from the methodological uh, perspective to, 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 to prove that this was the, the uh, let's say, most important factor or to, to, to somehow prove to what extent this factor played, uh, played uh, a role. So, for example, in case of, of uh, Europe, and it makes the matter even more complicated, is that not NATO, but the European Union was the main actor really dealing with uh, South and uh, East China uh, Sea. And uh, uh, EU likes to underline its independence and uh, show that, that, that its policy is driven by what's called principled uh, neutrality and the commitment to the rule-based uh, international uh, order. Uh, same with Japan. So, in addition to the alliance with the United States, uh, Japanese, Japanese policy towards uh, Russia after the uh, annexation of Crimea was uh, uh, influenced by Japanese objections to any change of territorial status quo by force. Apparently, and, and of course, because of the Japanese territorial dispute with, with uh, uh, China, but also it was influenced by Japanese membership in the G7, also partnership with NATO, commitment to the role-based international order, which of course we can say to, to all the US uh, allies. Um, 
In case of Australia, for example, its, its policy has resulted from non-permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council and uh, the shutdown of MH17 with 38 uh, Australians uh, on board. And um, yeah, in, in terms of, of uh, South Korea case, I think that its policy uh, was influenced by unwillingness to antagonize Russia because uh, of its role in any future efforts to bring about North Korea uh, denuclearization and Russia's role on the, on the, on the uh, peninsula. Uh, still, I think despite all difficulties in proving the, the security interest interdependencies, uh, there is considerable evidence uh, that, um, that, that, that which, which proves that they uh, existed. Uh, so while I haven't found any on the record statement of any official admitting that we did this because the US pushed, pushed us to, to, to do this, and I think it would be hard for any politicians to, to do this, and that's why it, it, it makes this the, the, the proving of this interdependences, uh, interdependences so uh, difficult. Um, uh, so still, the, the, there was uh, indirect uh, evidence. So indirect evidence included, for example, EU statements underlying that in defining their policy in the Asia-Pacific, uh, Europeans should take into account the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, transatlantic link. There are also like joint US, uh, EU statements, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on. And uh, in the case of Japan, a uh, number of press articles with anonymous statements of Japanese uh, officials claim that the Japanese approach was somehow constrained by the, by the uh, United States and the and United States made, it, made, 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 it, made its position clear to, to Japan to, to, to avoid like, uh, too close um, rapprochement between uh, two countries or in the sense uh, um, like U.S. I, 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 it was not in the U.S. interest that Japan somehow um, uh, refrained from 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 the, from, from, from uh, implementing the, the sanctions. Moving to the to the third type of interdependencies. So, like my my research showed that there were presence. They were present in 2009-2017 uh, time, time frame, and uh, they apply to force posture and operational factors, and to only to a lesser extent to, to uh, doctrinal uh, interdependencies. So um, my research fo focused only on uh, nuclear and missile defense uh, capabilities, but I think that the, the findings apply apply to, to, to U.S. to other U.S. Uh, capabilities uh, as well, but uh, I, I will just not not go into 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 details now. So, with regard to nuclear forces, I identified a few examples of links between nuclear postures in both regions. For example, uh, there was a relationship uh, between retaining dual capable aircraft in uh, Europe by the United States and the option to to uh, and. Um, live extension of B61 and uh, retirement of uh, TLAM N. So the 2010 nuclear posture review argued that the deterrence and assurance roles of TLAM N uh, could be adequately substitute, substituted by other means, including the forward deployed of dual capable uh, aircraft. Also what's important is that debate, debates on the need for basing non-strategic nuclear weapons in each region were influenced by U.S. nuclear posture in the, another region, in the other region. So in Europe, proponents of withdrawal of U.S. nuclear uh, weapons uh, point out uh, as, at the Asia model as the uh, example for, 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 for Europe to, to follow. So there, there, are, there are no nuclear weapons based in uh, the territory of any U.S. ally in, in, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, in contrast, uh, proponents of a more robust uh, U.S. Uh, extended nuclear deterrence in the Asia-Pacific 
mainly in South Korea, have cited uh, NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements uh, as possible solution uh, uh, to, 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 for their region, to, to augment uh, US external deterrence uh, uh, in their region. Uh, with regard to operational interdependencies, uh, maintaining an option to forward deploy US dual capable aircraft to the Asia Pacific was perceived by US allies in this region as contingent upon the continuity of NATO nuclear sharing uh, arrangements. And in the same time, uh, US allies uh, in the Asia Pacific were concerned about availability of DCA uh, with non-strategic nuclear weapons during uh, a crisis. So whether additional aircraft could, if needed, be redeployed from Europe uh, to, to the Asia Pacific. Um, it's also important that uh, NATO's uh, nuclear consultations were seen by South Korea and Japan as models uh, to emulate in their bilateral relationships uh, with the United uh, States. Uh, doctrinal interdependencies were the most difficult uh, uh, to prove. Uh, in general, the US, I think, faces a problem of making its declaratory policy in one region consistent with its declaratory policy in the other region. And for me, it's hard to believe, for example, that US would be able to um, adopt a sole purpose or no first use uh, policy only in one region. I think that it would create a, a tremendous pressure uh, on the US allies in the other region to do the same. And if not, the, the, the US uh, policy would uh, just not be seen as credible in any of, 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 of the regions. And with regard to missile defense postures, uh, the, the, the and, and um, force posture interdependencies, the Obama administration decision to replace Bush, Bush administration uh, missile defense plans in Europe with the European Phased Adaptive Approach, so EPAA, uh, was to some extent uh, driven by US military requirements in other regions, uh, including East uh, Asia. So the new uh, US missile defense architecture was meant to provide greater flexibility and be globally, globally deployable. Uh, also, the US decision to cancel the phase three of uh, EPAA in, uh, phase four of uh, EPAA in March 2013 was justified uh, by a need to augment missile defense uh, um, against uh, missile threats from uh, the TPRK. And the realization of fa phase three of the EPAA um, has depended on US-Japan joint uh, development of the SM-32A uh, interceptor. Operational interdependencies were also present. Uh, the phased adaptive approach uh, has been designed by the United States to provide an option to augment, to augment during uh, a crisis uh, missile defenses uh, in one region uh, with assets from another region. Uh, however, the number of uh, US missile defense assets, so including Aegis ships, missile interceptors, and theater missile defense is uh, limited. And uh, the question is whether the assumption about the global deployability of US missile defense systems uh, was not uh, too optimistic. Um, and the other uh, operational uh, interdependencies uh, is that uh, US allies in one region can, could build on experiences, uh, including uh, exercises and uh, missile defense tests in another region. And, uh, and this, this opportunity for cross-regional experience exchange has been provided by the Nimble Titan exercises led by the uh, United uh, States. Um, and again, doctrinal interdependencies were the most difficult to identify. So one example comes from 2009 when uh, the Obama administration was reviewing the, the missile defense 
uh, in Europe and uh, experts from Japan expressed concerns that any US concessions to Russian missile defense could negatively impact the development of, 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 of uh, missile defenses in, in uh, their region. And uh, to, sum, to sum up Obama's pre presidency, uh, I think that all three interdependencies were visible and the strongest were the military and security perceptions uh, interdependencies. And there is evidence that security interest interdependencies uh, uh, took place, uh, took place uh, as well. So uh, let's now move to the next part of my presentation. So the interdependencies during the Trump presidency. So what we should, what we should expect. And um, of course, the shortest answer is that it remains to be seen and uh, depends on uh, events. Um, Yet, I, I, I will share some observations about the development since the beginning of, of uh, this year. So, first, uh, security perceptions, interdependencies. So, since the beginning of Trump presidency, the classic uh, alliance security dilemma, the tension be between being abandoned or entrapped, uh, intensified in both regions. So, the concerns of U.S. allies uh, about abandonment were, however, not caused by fears about U.S. pivot to another region, but uh, by uncertainty, uncertainty about America's strategic uh, directions. So a number of statements uh, by President Trump led to anxieties about the future of U.S. alliance uh, policies. And Tensions between the United States and North Korea added concerns about entrapment, so fear that the U.S. overreaction could drag U.S. allies into a, a conflict on the peninsula. Uh, however, um, in some cases, this anxiety were at least partially uh, mitigated by statements by the President Trump himself and the secretaries of, of uh, defense and state, but also by uh, the U.S. did. So if you look at Central and Eastern Europe, so Central and Eastern Europeans were reassured by U.S. decision to increase funding for the uh, European uh, reassurance initiative, that so, so uh, the military presence of, of U.S. in the, in the region uh, continues. And uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europeans were like concerns, were, were concerned mostly about kind of a new reset in U.S.-Russia relations that might come on their expense, and uh, so far uh, it, 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 it hasn't happened. And in the case of Japan, it seems to be reassured by close relationship between uh, Trump and, and, uh, and Abe. And the alliance security dilemma seems to be the toughest for South Korea. Uh, so on the one hand, deeper case ICBM capability and thermonuclear device increased South Koreans' fears about abandonment, that in the longer term uh, U.S. security guarantees might, might somehow fade away. And what paradoxically, the very strong U.S. reaction to North Korea uh, nuclear and missile advancements uh, seemed to reinforce South Korean fears. So the, the argument uh, which I heard is that uh, before DPRK's uh, ICBM, U.S. somehow tried to uh, convince South Koreans to calm down, not be uh, too much concerned about North Korea. And uh, uh, South Koreans are saying now, but now when the U.S. territory is in range, the U.S. Uh, became worried. And, and, uh, um, uh, and, and it somehow uh, adds up to, to, to the, let's say, long-term abandonment uh, fears. And at the same time, South Korea seems to be anxious about possible unilateral U.S. actions against North uh, with without uh, Seoul's explicit agreement or uh, consultations. And uh, we will, of course, see what uh, 
uh, reassurance effect would be given by, by uh, would be provided by President Trump visit to, 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 to Seoul. Mm. And developments on the Korean Peninsula will have implications for European security. So they might lead to fears of abandonment, entrapment, and, you know, uh, and, and will impact the, the European perceptions about US uh, uh, reliability. So um, for, for example, um, a hypothetical US military action without South Korean consent might have a negative impact uh, on, on perception of US reliability in the eyes of uh, uh, Europeans, at least some, uh, some uh, Europe, Europeans, and uh, these anxieties are, are um, exemplified by statements, uh, statement of, of one uh, British, British uh, expert. And with regard to security interest interdependencies, uh, making a North Korea a top priority um, have already led to a greater NATO attention to the threat posed by the DPRK. So um, it's reasonable to assume that U.S. requests led to growing European pressure on China to do more regarding, regarding uh, uh, North, North Korea. Of course, the question is to what extent are the Europeans willing to support the United States in, in, in pressing, uh, pressing uh, uh, China. So also what's interesting that now in Europe, like, each time there is a press conference at NATO headquarters, there are questions. So if there, are, if there would be a crisis, if there were crises on the Korea, Korea Peninsula, would Article 5 uh, uh, apply? Mm. But I think that the real tests or test of how U.S. really, how the alliance with the United States can shape the, 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 the policies of, 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 of uh, U.S. allies would be provided by, by, by uh, the fate and future of the, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, so it, will, it would somehow show the, show the limits of, of, uh, of, of uh, to what extent uh, US allies are, are ready to, to, to follow. Uh, so this is just, just, uh, just an example. So on the top, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, so it's, these are the, the remarks. Uh, from the, um, let's say, US participant and the North Atlantic Council a meeting in May, in May 2017 when the US was very, let's say, explicit of encouraging Europeans uh, to, to, to uh, support its policy to North Korea and to put more pressure on China and subsequent uh, North Atlantic Council statements and, and some statements of European officials showed that to some degree US was uh, successful. Um, uh, and finally, military interdependencies, interdependencies during Trump, uh, uh, Trump uh, presidency. So in the nuclear field, uh, uh, we have already seen in recent months that NATO's nu current nuclear arrangement continue to influence uh, a debate about basing nuclear weapons uh, uh, in, the, in the South uh, Korea. And I think that any decision by the US to augment nuclear software or uh, hardware in uh, Europe, uh, in, in the case of uh, nuclear posture review, may have an impact on Japan and South Korea and uh, vice versa. And perhaps the consultations mechanism uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the Asia would closer resemble those, those uh, in, 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 in NATO. And with regard to missile defense, uh, it's a question of how the growing North Korean threat might impact the further development of EPAA, uh, the availability of capabilities to strengthen theater missile defense against Russia, and the left of launch strategies in, in both, uh, both regions. Uh, a related question is to what extent US response to the INF treaty violation uh, by Russia, uh, by Russia uh, would be driven by military requirements in uh, two regions. And, uh, to conclude my presentation today, uh, let's move to my last uh, two slides. So, as I have tried to demonstrate, US allies in NATO Europe and uh, in the Asia Pacific had been aligned by default owing to their shared reliance on US extended deterrence commitments. So, there is 
considerable evidence that shows that this was the case during the Obama administration and how relationship between US allies in these two regions could evolve during Trump administrations, it's, it's, it's still unclear. Uh, but I think it's clear evidence that at least some interdependencies uh, uh, exist. Mm, and the question is whether alignment by default, so this kind of a, a spokes, hub, hub spokes uh, relationship between US allies in different uh, regions is sustainable and whether it could somehow transform into different type of uh, relationship. Uh, and the spectrum of possibilities is broad. So it includes competition of US allies uh, for US political and military attention, reduce, reduced reliance uh, on the United States, uh, or closer relations between uh, US allies in uh, different uh, region. And one possibility is uh, what I call a whole wheel extended deterrence. So extended deterrence in which the United States, the hub, and the US allies from different regions, the spokes, share responsibility for the whole wheel and not only for particular sections. And much, of course, will depend on US decisions and actions concerning commitments to alliances. So the strengthening of alliances is constant effort and nothing should be uh, taken for granted. And even alignment by default could be stronger, weaker, depending on the policy of US uh, administration. And uh, of course, also US allies have to decide about whether and how they would like to man manage these cross-regional uh, links. Uh, and to make an informed and conscious decision about uh, the future of alignment by default. And the US, together with its allies, uh, should answer at least uh, the, the following three uh, questions. And if the overall response is positive, I think that it will make the case for stronger cross-regional uh, cooperation and, and interaction. So first, is the security of US allies indivisible? So would an attack on US allies in one region, caused apparently by a failure of US extended deterrence, make allies in another region more vulnerable to attack or threat? So, for example, would an attack on North Korea, on the South Korea, make Europeans more vulnerable to Russia's threats and aggression? How might Russia exploit any US uh, vulnerabilities in the, in the uh, Asia Pacific. Um, and the other question is, uh, would the failure of extended deterrence in one region really matter? Of course, um, um, like, so, so, so how, how it would impact the commitment of the United States to extended deterrence and, and perceptions of, of US allies about US credibility and reliability. Uh, and second question, to what extent would the effectiveness of a multi-domain response uh, to regional challenges uh, depend on greater cross-regional uh, cooperation. So greater European burden sharing in terms of defense is not only of interest of Europe and the United States, but it's also in the interest of US allies in the Asia Pacific. And I think that the possibility of global burden sharing should be somehow exploited uh, or, or um, examined. So in what kind of capabilities Europeans could invest to, I don't know, leave more US capabilities available for the US allies in, in the Asia Pacific? Uh, also, coordinated economic sanctions constitute an integral tool of multi-domain uh, deterrence. So, is the particip participation of all US allies in different regions indispensable to make the, the, the sanctions uh, effective? And the, the last question is, to what extent could a united front of US allies strengthen regional, regional, deterren uh, regional extended deterrence uh, arrangements? So, would it be helpful for extended deterrence effectiveness if the adversaries 
knew in, knew in advance that their aggressive actions would provoke response from US allies from different regions. And of course the question is, would the benefits of cross-regional cooperation outweigh potential risk and, and uh, costs? For example, closer China-Russia alignment, and of course the difficulties of coordinating uh, uh, policies in, in three, three regions, so Northern America, Europe, and uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, I hope that these questions and the whole presentation will stimulate some, some, uh, some of your uh, questions, and uh, I would be ready and, ready and happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. <laughs>